All right, buffers. Uh, I'm going to start today's lesson with an analogy of what a buffer is before I give you all the science stuff, okay? So I'm going to read to you some buffer analogies I found online, which is interesting because maybe you guys don't even know these analogies. A buffer is like a shock absorber. In your car, you have shocks. In case you don't know this, your bike probably has shocks if you have a good bike. Uh, a shock absorber. So it says when an acid-base buffer is like a shock absorber, something to prevent a disturbance while retaining the original conditions or structure. So in your car, you have shocks, shock absorber. They're meant to absorb the bounce that you feel. So if you don't have shocks in your car and you go through a pothole, you're going to bounce really hard, right? kind of like get thrown around but if you have a good shocks in your car and you own like the nicest car with the best shocks you go through a pothole and maybe you just go like that right little bounce because it absorbs all of the disturbance that's happening that's what a buffer is like it absorbs disturbances all right the next analogy <clears throat> it is a hydrogen sponge all right so a buffer's main role is to accept acid or base and not change the pH. We'll get through that later. So you can think of a buffer almost like a sponge where it accepts all of the hydrogen into the sponge and doesn't change the pH because the pH would be changed if there's more H plus floating around, right? But instead of it floating around, it absorbs it all. You just kind of wipe it all off of your counter. It's like a sponge and it holds it in there, right? so it absorbs it. The last one, it's a cushion. It cushions the blow. That's just spelled in the English way, cushion. They leave the H out. So it is like a pillow. So this one says you are fighting a buffer. So you're the disturbance. You go and you're literally having a fist fight with your buffer, which is like a pillow. Um, you're trying to break the buffer in order to drop the pH or increase the, pre the pH. Um, the buffer is like a pillow which protects the solution from taking wild pH swings. So like, for example, the pillow is taking all of my punches that I'm trying to bust through this pH region and the pillow is taking all of the hits. Now at some point I might break the pillow and once I've broken the pillar, pillow I have no buffer anymore and then the pH drops. So you create a buffer solution. The whole idea is to resist changes in your pH. So it's either like a sponge, it's like a pillow, it's like a shock absorber. Kind of get it? All right. So we're going to go to buffers today. And I'm going to use lots of examples to try and help you get through this. Tomorrow we'll finish the lecture. And on Monday, we are going to um, do a buffer demo experiment day. So I'm going to do the lab for you, and you're going to do all the calculations each step at a time so that you can see how to handle all different types of buffer questions. It's unfortunate because in this class, right, we might do one lab, but every time that you're doing this, it's always on paper for you. You don't actually realize that chemists do this in the lab every day. They don't care that they have to solve a piece of paper. They care because they have to make a solution to do something. So I'm going to do the lab for you so that you can do the calculations as if you were in lab as a chemist trying to make this. So the first thing to understanding a buffer is that it's all based on the common ion effect. So a buffer, again, is going to be a solution that can resist change in pH by having the ability to react with anything you put in it in terms of acids or bases. All right, so if I put an acid into my beaker and I want it to be able to be reacted with, I have to have a base floating in my beaker. You guys are all kind of looking at your papers and not me. I know. I'm not sure what you're writing yet. Ready? Ready? So I have a beaker, and I'm going to dump in a disturbance. My disturbances are always acid or base, okay? My pillow doesn't know who is going to come into my beaker. My pillow is my shock absorber, my sponge, right? So it's either H plus gets dumped in or OH minus gets dumped in. In order to fight them off, I have to have both acid and base floating in my beaker ready to take the punch. 
So if I dump OH into my beaker, what needs to be there to react with it? H+. Plus. If I dump H plus into my beaker, who needs to be there to react with it? Okay, so I need acid and base in my beaker. And both of those are not going to be strong acids and strong bases. They're going to be weak acids and conjugate bases or weak bases and conjugate acids. So the way that you create a buffered solution is you start with a weak acid or a weak base and you dump that in water. We know that the reaction for a weak acid or weak base lies very far to the left, right? It has some K value, but it's mostly this. There's lots of this floating in the beaker because it has weak equilibrium. Agreed? All right, but I also need floating in my beaker a base. Right now I have this base floating in there, but in such small amounts. So if I dumped an acid in, would this be able to react with it to much? No, because there wouldn't be enough in there. There would be a very, very small amount, and then immediately if I dumped an acid in, the pH would drop. So I need something in there to basically eat it up and react with it. I'm going to use the word eat it up a lot, but you can't write that on your paper. You're going to write react with it, okay? So in order to put a lot of this in the beaker, I add what's called a salt. What is our definition of a salt? It's an ionic salt, an ionic compound, which means it needs to be soluble, 100% soluble. My salt that I'm putting into this buffer has to be soluble. So what am I going to stick it with? Solubility rules. Group 1A or nitrates. You need an anion because at some point we're going to need to use cations that are our salts. So if I put this in, the conjugate base as a salt, I can put in NAF, KF, LIF. I can put in any of them, right? Because they're completely soluble and they'll dissociate. So this is a big one-way arrow, 100% dissociation. There's none of this left, but there's lots of this in there. And then to further add to this, right, this is common ion effect right here. So what happens to this reaction? It drives this back to the left even more so, which means I have lots of HF in there and lots of F minus in there. So inside my beaker then, I have HF floating around and F minus. Lots of it. So now if I dump in H+, plus, who reacts with it? F-, F minus, right? And if I dump in OH, who reacts with it? HF. Following? So if you react HF with OH-, minus, this is strong, one-way arrow, I make water and F minus. Do you see how very little changes would be made to the pH because I don't make OH or H plus? Do you see that? All I make is more conjugate base. So my pH really isn't going to drop at all due to the addition, I'm sorry, it won't go up at all due to the addition of OH minus. So the goal is to keep the pH Yes, always. Your blood is a buffer. If your blood wasn't a buffer, you would die because you ingest things that are acidic and basic all the time, right? Like I drink lemon water a lot, so I would constantly be decreasing the pH of my blood. So your blood acts as a buffer because it can accept the H plus that I'm putting in, it reacts with it, and keeps the pH of my blood at a steady pH so that it doesn't go up or down continuously. So the whole goal of a buffer is to accept OH or H plus such that it will not produce an acid or a base that would harmfully affect the pH of it. Now your pHs aren't going to stay the same. Like say the pH is 8.5 and you dump in a whole lot of OH minus, the pH might go up to like 8.6, 8.7, but it's not going to jump to 14 if there wasn't a buffer. If there wasn't a buffer, it would jump immediately, right? Because it would immediately add OH minus into your solution. Are we following? Okay, the next one. This is a weak base. How do I know? NH3 is a weak base, right? 
So according to Le Chatier's, right, this is weak equilibrium lies far to the left. So there's lots of this. And then this is my conjugate acid. How do I make a salt of my conjugate acid? Stick it with nitrate. Now this suck it with chloride because you guys only really memorize these solubility rules, group 1A and nitrates. There's lots of other solubility rules. You know that, right? But for you, on my exam and the AP exam, you're not going to put chloride. You're going to put nitrate, right? Because that's the only one that you've been told to memorize this whole time. So yours would be, say, ammonium nitrate, which would dissociate into nitrate and ammonium, which means that this is your common ion. This drives this to the left. And there is lots of this because it experiences 100% dissociation. So now in this buffer, I have lots of weak base and lots of conjugate acid. Every time I make a buffer or do a buffer problem, I write out both reactions and I literally circle lots and circle and write lots. So that I tell myself in this problem, these are the two things I have. And then I'm ready to work with them based on the disturbance that the problem gives me. All right, so we're going to practice you guys making a buffer right now. I want you to write out two different reactions for a buffer that comes from, I used the same examples earlier. Let me just find them. So write a buffer. HClO2, right? That's the weak acid that I'm using. I want you to write two reactions that would create a buffer. Yay. All right, so let's try one more. That's all you're ready? That's all just lots? All you're doing right now is recognizing how to make a buffer. We're not doing any math yet. We'll get there. So do you, I just want to make sure you understand that there's these two pieces that you always have to have, right? And that they're there, ready to accept the changes. We'll get to one math question today. All right, the next one um, I chose was something odd. Okay, go ahead and write a buffer with this. C5H5N. Okay, so what is this? An acid or a base? A base. All right, so I stick this with water. Double way arrow because it's weak, and what happens to it? Yes, and it's okay if you add it here and make it H6, but what it's important is that you put the plus on because it was neutral and you added the H plus. So then there's OH minus left over. All right, now I have to make a salt of it. It looks weird, but it doesn't matter because what is this? A ka conjugate acid, which is your positive charge piece. So what are you going to put with it? A nitrate. Right? What else could you put with it? If you put another cation with it. Look, it, I want to point something out to you. If you're, I will give you weird ones like this. You know that this has to show up on this side, doesn't it? It has to be there. So then you'll just recognize, well, I have to put it with something that it can break up with. So this is NHNO3. As weird as that looks, that's what it is, right? And then that completely dissociates into NO3 minus. And now I have lots of this and lots of this. Most of the time, they will give you acetic acid or ammonia. Almost 100% of the time. And it'll be really only on a few things where you'll see a buffer made with something else, at least for the AP exam. I mean, there's lots of different buffers. Sometimes they'll use like a phosphate compound. But most often, it's acetic acid and ammonia. That's their two favorites to use. All right. So here, again, is our definition. I've talked a lot about this already, so we can kind of go through these quickly. A buffer, main definition, resist changes in pH. When small quantities of strong acids or strong bases are added to a buffered solution, the changes in the pH are small. That's the whole point, is to kind of be that shock absorber. It's always made with a weak acid and it's salt, or a weak base and it's salt. So if it's this one, you're going to couple it, the salt, with a group 1A. If it's this one, you're going to couple it with nitrate. Group 1A, nitrate. 
so funny because the things that I want you to write down, you don't. And then when you're not writing, you are writing. When you're, I'm like, what are you writing? What could you possibly be writing? A weak acid in its salt means the salt is coupled with a group 1A because the salt would be the negative at that point. I'm sorry, the anion would be the negative part. A weak base in its salt would mean that you need to couple the positive cation with nitrate. Okay. Uh, last example here. This is another, this is one of the most common that they'll give you. It's acetic acid. You make sodium acetate and then it's ready to react with an acid or a base. All right, so say I give you nitric acid and I dump it into this buffer. What's my reaction? I dump nitric acid into this. What's the reaction that I should write? No. H plus. No. All right, so look, in my beaker, I have these two reactions. So really, what do I have in here? Why do I write lots? Because that's what's floating around. I have lots of this and lots of this. Agree? I also have a lot of Na plus floating around, but who cares? That's a spectator, right? There is Na plus. All right, so then I dump in nitric acid. Okay, so my reaction is H plus. Now what? <laughs> One way arrow. Oh, that's pretty sweet. Okay, this is where we're headed. That's why you have to know what do I mean by lots? That's what's floating in the beaker, ready to react with it. If I told you OH went in here, who reacts with OH? The acetic acid, right? And then this becomes my reaction. I'm showing you all this because this is where we're going to go with ice charts. We're going to end up calculating the pHs of these, but you should recognize that there's really very going to be little change because you don't end up with HO, I mean OH minus or H plus in either of these examples. All right, a buffer in capacity, I usually will call this the buffer zone, uh, and then I'll use the phrase I buffer out. So this is, if you're in the buffer zone, it's like you in the rink punching the pillow and you're trying to get out. So at some point you bust through the buffer zone and you buffer out. Buffering out means there's nothing left in this beaker to accept this disturbance. So I buffer out when there's no more left of this. How could there be no more left of it? It all reacted, right? So think of it this way. I put in one mole of acetate and one mole of acetic acid. So I have both pieces like this, one mole and one mole. And then I dump in one mole of nitric acid. Well, all of my acetate goes away, right? What if I dump in another mole of nitric acid? There's nothing there to fight it. So the pH immediately drops because there's tons of H plus floating around. Get it? So that's what this buffer capacity is. It's the ability of a buffered solution to accept protons or hydroxide ions with a, without a significant change of pH. The higher the concentrations of both of those pieces are, the greater the buffering capacity. In other words, I used 5 moles and 5 moles of each. Well, what happens if I put in 10 moles and 10 moles of each? It has a longer time to buffer, right? I would have to put how many moles of nitric acid in for it to buffer out in that example? 10 moles, right? So the more pieces, the higher the concentration there is of each of your pieces, the greater in the buffering capacity. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. The higher the concentrations of each of these things. The longer the buffer will be. Yes. And I say longer in terms of assuming that you're adding the same amount the whole time. Mm -hmm. But it just means that it can accept more H plus or more OH minus before the pH drops dramatically or increases dramatically. Okay? Okay. This is called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, and you're going to use it every time you see the word buffer. I'm going to point something out, though, with this. Um, it is entirely possible to do buffering questions without this equation. I've seen students do it both ways. You know how you can come to an answer using two different techniques? It's sort of up to you how you want to do it. 
I will primarily use this technique, but you can easily solve for this using Ka. Because Ka can help you, right? Ka is equal to your, basically your conjugate times H plus over your HA, which is where you'll get your pH from is if you had your H plus. I'm just going to throw that out there, that if you see problems or you're looking at stuff online and it just uses Ka, it's definitely a possibility. And your brain may just switch to do that on an exam and you still might get the right answer. So if somebody's like, oh, I used Henderson Hasselbach and you did it, it doesn't mean that you're entirely wrong. Could be though. All right, so I want to just highlight when you do the pH equation, it matches pKa and it matches your product over your reactant and that's specifically for for the first reaction that we're writing, which is going to be uh, the dissociation of the base or the dissociation of the acid. Like this, like we just drew before what I had you guys do. So for acid or base dissociation, not of the salt. We're not going to use this as our salt. So say, for example, I used acetic acid. The dissociation of this is CH3COO minus plus H plus. So this would be this base over this acid. So this over this. Do you follow that? That's what that means. And I'm going to point out again to you that if I have a basic reaction, like NH3 instead plus water, it's going to go to NH4 plus plus OH minus. This is a base. This expression will say POH is equal to the pKb plus the log of the, the conjugate acid now, so NH4 plus over NH3. So that's why I want you to focus on its products over the reactants for the reaction that you're writing. Because they will not always give you acid reactions. They will give you base reactions too. So I can solve for pOH, sorry, all the laptops are in your way. I could solve for pOH is equal to pKb plus the log, and then this will be of your product over your reactant. And that will be for the base reaction, hence the bases. Okay, when we look at the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, the best way to make a buffer is to put equal parts of each piece in there, right? Because you don't know if you're making a buffer. Your blood doesn't know that you're going to eat something basic today. It just has equal parts in there so that it's ready to accept either an acid or a base, right? So when you make your buffer, you want this concentration to be equal to this concentration. Do you agree? So if this is equal to this, then what is this fraction? One. Do you know what the log of one is? Zero. zero. So the log of one is zero, which means if you make equal parts, you want your pH to be equal to your pKa. We can look up Ka values in a book. So if I said, Hannah, I want you to go and make a buffer with a pH of 8.5 using some acid, you will go and find the, P the Ka values, take the negative log of the Ka, and find which one would give you a pH closest to 8.5. So that's what we're going to practice. So this is the key word. It's helpful when choosing a conjugate acid-base pair. If a buffer needs to have a certain pH, one would choose a weak acid with a pKa value that is very close to the desired pH. Underline that sentence, because you're going to be asked to do that. markers are just not black enough. Right? This is a brand new marker. Yes.
your stomach is different than your blood. Your stomach is an acidic environment to begin with. Yeah, like your blood will absorb the nutrients and such, like it takes out from your stomach. Um, so your pH in your blood has to be buffered to accept whatever comes in. But your stomach, your pH of your stomach is acidic. You could adjust the pH of your stomach for sure with different things that you eat or drink. Um, okay. Acidic or basic? You die immediately. No, I think... Um, trying to see. Yeah. I don't remember the exact value. I think I wrote it in my notes, but I'm not sure. Oh, this is the wrong set of notes. I don't know. I wrote it in my notes somewhere. I think it's like eight point something. All right. So look at this slide. The pH equals the pKa when A minus is equal to HIA. That's because the ratio is one. Oh, sorry, your blood is pH is somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45. So it maintains that pH at all times. If the pH falls below, no, 6.8 or above 7.8, it can kill you. How? I don't know. You buffer out. <laughs> Literally, that's how it must happen. Well, I don't know exactly what's in the blood that makes it buffer. But if you continue to put too much acid into that, your cell membranes would not be able to handle the adjustments in pH. Your blood is slightly more basic. 7.35. Okay. Nope. Nope. We're going to keep moving. We're going to keep moving. Yes. All right. Buffers, buffers made from very weak acids and their salts have high pH values. That's because, think about this, a Ka of a very weak acid is really, really small, right? This is a really small number. If I take the negative log, because remember, P of anything is a negative log, I get a pH value of 10. If I make a buffer of a stronger weak acid, meaning it has a higher Ka value, and I take the negative log of that, my pH ends up to be 4.0. So the point that you need to know is that weak acids have higher pH values, that makes sense, and stronger weak acids have lower pH values. That makes sense, right? Okay. Uh, just taking this slide, sort of, we're going to quickly go through this. Basically, it's just pointing out that your ratio is really not going to adjust your pH that much. So if I basically take this, my pH equals my pKa, and I increase the concentration of this by a factor of 10, the pH would only adjust by 0.1. I think that's what that's showing you there, a 1. So that would be added on to this, plus the log of 1. That's what it's showing you. So adding small amounts of acid base to a buffered solution caused very small changes in pH. You could plug in numbers, fake numbers, to see this. But we will do this uh, through homework, and we'll do it in my lab demo day. So I'm not going to throw up a bunch of numbers right now. All right. So we're going to do these two problems. If we don't get through the second one, then you're going to try it on your own anyway. And you're going to do questions one through eight. Your homework packet seems intense, and it is. It's because it's two different homework packs. But the second one, I circled the questions I want for you to do, and then it accidentally got copied twice. So it seems like you have more homework than you do. So the second set is just, I like these questions, and the AP exam has put them on frequently enough that I thought that they're important for you to try. Do we have to try them tonight? No, you're not ready to try those yet. Oh. So we're not ready to do one through eight? No, no one ready. through eight on the non-circled problems. So in other words, you're going to do lecture 33, one through eight problems. Then ones that are circled are lecture 32, just out of order. All right, let's take this problem. Suppose you're required to create a 0 0.50 liter buffered solution where HA and A minus have similar concentrations. <coughs> Using the information below, select the weak acid and conjugate base pair that would produce a buffered solution with a pH of 4.80. I'm just going to show you this is incorrect information. It's supposed to be 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative fourth. So how do you 
do you find out which one to use? If you want a pH to be 4.80, then you want your acid to have a similar pKa. PKA. So you're going to take the negative log of each of these to find the pKa, and then you're just going to match it. You say, ah, oh, this one's closer than this one, so I'm going to use this one. Try that. Take your calculators out, take the negative log, and match them. All right. Yep, they did. Okay, so 3.18 versus 4.74, and we wanted our pH to be what? 4.8. So we would obviously choose this one because it's much closer. So you're going to use which acid? Um, the, the second one, the acetic acid. If you're making a buffer, you're going to put this in, and what else? Salt. Which salt? Don't write salt. Which salt? N-A. Yes. Does everybody get that? I will ask you that question. That seems to be something that tricks students. They don't quite know what I mean. When I say, what salt will you add? It's the conjugate base with a group 1A. So I would put in sodium acetate or potassium acetate in there. And that's the salt. So that's what they're showing you. And you would put in this and this. You can't go in the back lab and find a bottle of this anion. You have to get a solid. So you have to stick it with its salt. So sodium or potassium or any group 1A. All right, the second part of the question says, estimate the concentrations of weak acid and conjugate base that are necessary to produce an initial pH of 4.80 and prevent significant pH change if you put in 0.125 moles of sodium hydroxide. This is a really tricky question. We're kind of starting with one of the harder questions first. So watch uh, first how we solve this. We have in our beaker, we already know, acetic acid and acetate floating around. Do we agree? And then I'm going to dump in 0.125 moles of OH minus. Before you start this problem, just think about this. What is going to react with this? Acetic acid. How many moles of acetic acid should be in there? 0.125 moles. Yes. Why? Because if it's not in there, it's going to not have anything to react with, and immediately your pH is going to go up because you have hydroxide floating around. Right? We're trying to resist changes in pH. So if I have extra OH minus floating around, pH goes up immediately. But if I don't have OH floating around because this reacted with all of it, then I'm still in my buffer region. So I need at least 0.125 moles, but I'll calculate my actual concentration, 0.125 divided by 0 0.50 liters, I get 0.25 molar concentration. So technically, I need 0.25 moles, 0.25 molar of this. Do we agree? Except if you were doing this as a chemist, would you cut it that close? No. No. It's like you, your parents give you lunch money, and your lunch is going to cost $3.43. Do they send you with $3.43? They send you with a little extra, just in case, right? Anytime I send my kids somewhere to go to pizza with their friends, I don't send them with $2. I send them with, like, 10 just in case. Like, I don't want their other friends' parents having to pay for it. Maybe I give them extra money so they can buy a bag of chips and soda. Get it? You're a chemist. You're not going to put in exactly 0.125 moles. You'll put in a little bit more just in case. So these are just-in-case moles. So instead of us saying we want 0.25 molar, we want just in case, and I'm going to tell you, you just raise it by 0.01, 0.26 molar. Okay? So if this came up in like when we had full choice and they gave us 0.25 and 0.26, we always... I've never seen that. <laughs> but, okay. but I probably would say that choose the 0.26. Okay. Okay. So let's just do the question from the very beginning. This is the thought process. You guys understand that already, right? So first thing, though, I need to do is I need to find the correct ratio. Why? The pH here is 4.80, but what was the pKa value that I found? 4.74. All right. If these were in a one-to-one -one ratio, what would my pH be? 4.74, right? But it's not which means that this ratio is not one-to-one. -one. It means that it's something different. 
So I already showed you that our concentrations are going to be 0.26 molar, right? I just need to figure out what ratio of this to this it must be of 0.26. I know that sounds a little tricky. So we're going to solve. We're going to solve for this as a ratio. As this whole thing becomes the ratio, this whole con um, expression is going to be our x value. I just want to know what ratio they are of each other. So I'm going to solve for that ratio. So I plug in and I solve. So you subtract out 0.474, and then this is log x, 0.06 equals log x. And then I do 10 to the 0.06, not negative, because there's no negative around. So 10 to the 0.06, and I get a ratio of 1.1. There's no negative. We only use that when we had pH equals the negative log. So since there's no negative, we don't need the negative. Wait, did you? Yeah, we Because just like you did with me before, you did pH equals negative log, right, of x, then all you did is 10 to the negative x, right? So when you take the log of something to reverse it, you 10 it. I have no explanations. No explanations. Ten. Yes, and then there's swirling, and I don't know what that means. Okay. Did we all get 1.1? Wait a second. What does 1.1 mean? Does it mean that there's more or less? What? Oh, yes. More products. I'm thinking you're saying denominator in my head. More products, meaning the numerator is larger, right? We all agree 1.1 means the numerator is larger because if I had a decimal, it would mean the denominator is larger. So this is in a higher concentration by a factor of 1.1. All right. Now we go back to here where we were being smart before we started. And we were like, hey, we're going to make this 0.26 molar, but it's 0.26 molar times 1.1 in just the numerator. So I have, like we just discussed before, 0.25 molar is the minimum concentration that I need it to be, but I'm going to adjust it to 0.26 just in case, right? That's what this whole slide says. And I'm also going to point out that that says this will increase by 0.25 and this will decrease by 0.25. Why? What does the OH react with? Right? So if this happens, this is 0.25, this was the 0.26, this goes away by 0.25, and this forms by 0.25, and this was 0.26, right? We're going to ice chart this eventually. We're not doing it right now. Don't even write this down. I'm just pointing out to you that that's why this says this increases by 0.25. Do you understand that? And this decreases by 0.25 because it's reacting with it. All right, so now we're going to multiply the numerator by 1.1. And then we can calculate 0.26 times 1.1 will give me my 0.29 ratio. Remember the reason why these aren't equal to each other is because the pH didn't equal the pKa. If they were in a one-to-one -one ratio, then it would have just been 0.26 over 0.26. But they're not. So now your ratio gives you your concentrations, and the answer is 0.29 molar of acetate which really means to put in 0.29 molar of sodium acetate, right, of the salt, and 0.26 molar of acetic acid. Following? All right, you try the next problem. Yep. Because you can't go in the back and find an anion floating in a bottle. You go in the back and you find a solid, a salt, and then you can use that and weigh it out. <laughs> Okay. All right, next problem. Suppose you're required to create a 1.35 liter phosphate buffered solution with a pH of 7.29. Look at the information on the bottom. It gives you your pKa's. Which one are we going to use? The second one, H2PO4 minus. What kind of salt am I going to put in? 
Well, tell me what it's going to be. Not nitrate, no. Well, make it. I want it. Don't say N-A. N-A what? N-A what? See, that's the part that you guys... Na2, HPO4. That's the salt. You crisscross it, right? With a salt. This is an acid. How do I know? Look over here. It gave up an H. It gave up an H to this. How do I know it's an acid? Because there's H plus produced. Right? All right, that was the first part. Part B. Estimate the concentration of weak acid and conjugate base that are necessary to produce an initial pH of 7.29 and prevent significant change if 0.45 moles of either an acid or a base are added. It really doesn't matter what they tell you to add. You need to adjust the pH, the concentrations. Step one? Write it. The Henderson-Hasselbach. Yeah. Yes. Solve for your ratio. The bell's ringing in one minute. So if you need to, just jot down what you see here. Now remember that this is the ratio x. X, X. We're solving for the ratio. So the ratio is 1.2, right? The change was going to be 0.45 molar. So 0.45 molar, sorry, divided by 1.35 liters gives me 0.33. What do I need my concentration to actually be, though? Just in case. 0.34. And then multiply your 0.34 times the ratio 1.2, and that tells you your new concentration. You only multiply the numerator. And look, you can check your work, because once you solve these, put it back in the Henderson-Hasselbach and see if you get the correct pH. All right, good job. OK, so it says, how many moles of sodium, and that is CLO minus, which is hypochlorite. So how many moles of sodium hypochlorite must be added? to a 650 milliliter solution with 0.5 molar uh, hypochlorous acid to create a buffered, not a buffed, solution with a pH of 7.5 K is that, assume that the volume doesn't change. When I first looked at this problem, I, my approach will be different than the approach on the slides. You can, remember we talked already about how you could use Henderson-Hasselbach or you could use Ka. I prefer, if I take this problem and I'm trying to find pH, if I just go ahead, I have a Ka, I can find pKa, and if I take the log and I'm going to write out my reaction so you can see it, it's HOCl, double white arrow, goes to H plus plus OCl minus, and then I have NaOCl, one white arrow, Na plus plus OCl minus. I have lots of this in my buffer, and I have lots of this, right? The log is always going to be of my product over my reactant of which reaction? The dissociation of the acid or the base, the first one. I say first one because I'm assuming you're always going to write the acid first and then the, or the base and then your salt. So it's going to be the product over the reactant of the first dissociation of the acid or base. So this is going to be the concentration of OCl minus over the concentration of HOCl. I have the concentration of HOCl already. I have a pKa and I can find my, where is it, um, my OCL minus from, as, as my X, I'm sorry, I have my pH. So this is 7.50, I lost where I was. I can do the log of 3.5 times 10 to the negative eighth plus the log of, and now here I'm just going to put X over, and it's my 0 0.50 molar solution. That's a really easy setup, right? Because if I'm finding this, this is OCL minus, OCL minus is the same as NaOCL, isn't it? Because this is essentially the same concentration because it's in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I find my concentration, I can back calculate and find my moles, right? This is how I would have handled it, but I'm going to show you how you can handle it using Ka. If you have a pH, you can also use Ka, which is the same thing as this expression, which is H plus times OCL minus over HOCL. Do you have all these pieces? You have Ka, you have HOCL, uh, you have H plus from your pH, and then all you have to do is solve for OCL minus, which will be in the same concentration as this. 
So you have two different possibilities. You can use Henderson-Hasselbalch or you can use the Ka expression. So let's just get through the slides so you can see how they do that. Yeah. You can define H plus. This, you still need to find H plus from 10 to the negative 7.5 for this piece. But I'm not doing that if I use Henderson Hasselbach because I can just plug in my pH directly because it gave it to me. So there's two different options. You can choose to do either. And maybe your brain will immediately go to use Ka or maybe it'll use Henderson Hasselbach. My point is that if your friends say, oh, you need to use Henderson Hasselbach and you didn't, you might still have the same answer as that. So first thing that this slide is showing is that you find your concentration of H plus from your pH. And then you're going to use Ka to solve for the molarity of your OCl minus, which in turn is going to be the NaOCl. And that's exactly what I'm writing up here. I'm just putting in my Ka value. I find my H plus. This is X, and then this is 0 0.50. If you do choose to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, you'll solve for this piece, subtract that out, and then you will have a log of this, just like you did for homework last night. You would solve for this as one whole expression first, as a ratio, and then your, go ahead, thank you. Then your ratio would be just set that equal to this algebraic expression, okay? Okay, so you choose which method you want, your brain will automatically go to one or the other. And like I said to you in the past, you can really ignore Henderson-Hasselbalch completely and just use Ka all the time. Preferably, though, I think it's, I like to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch. Almost because it's, it's like an immediate, I know what equation to use. When I see the word buffer, I immediately know that I have a way to solve it. So I always go to Henderson-Hasselbalch. All right, the next one is uh, just calculating your moles. So once you find 0.55 molar, you just use the molarity equation. Molarity equals moles over liters. So it's 0.55 is equal to x over 0.65. And this is just using dimensional analysis. So the answer is 0.36 moles of sodium hypochlorite, recognizing that your hypochlorite is going to be the same as your sodium hypochlorite because it's in a one-to-one -one ratio. You know that I don't do this, neither do you, so you probably shouldn't write it like that. You write 0.55 molarity equals x over 0.65 liters, and then you solve for x. Okay, this slide um, is just sort of like a multiple choice type problem to see if you can recognize uh, kind of math without a calculator and handle the different, um, I guess, approaches to using a log. So yes, you can memorize this. You can make a note card and just tell yourself, if pH is less than pKa, the acid form has a higher concentration. I hate that. I would not memorize that ever because it doesn't explain math to you at all. And it doesn't apply. What happens if I have a base? Now what are you going to do? You can't handle it because you're not sure what you're even doing. So remember that this can also be for pOH is equal to pKb plus the log of, and now it would be of your product over your reactant. So your product in this case would be like Hb for base, and this would be like your B minus. So it's always going to be product over reactant. It doesn't matter that it's acid or base. I would never use this word, the acid. I would just say either the product or the reactant. So let's think about this in terms of math and not approach this as memorization. What it's saying is if your pH is less than pKa, let's make something up. pH is 3.4, pKa is 3.8, okay? Plus the log of some number x. If I do this, I subtract this out first and I get a negative number. So a negative number is going to be used, and what do you do to solve for x? 10 to that negative number. So 10 raised to a negative number will always give, take your calculator out and tell me, 
Because sometimes you just need to do it. Literally, like, punch in a bunch of 10 to the negative numbers and see what you get every time. A positive decimal, right? Do you see that? You will always get a decimal. What does a decimal mean? All right, so we're solving for x. So what does a decimal mean if I solve for x? Is my numerator or my denominator larger? Denominator. denominator. What is your denominator? It's always a reactant. So that's why I hate that this says the acid form. It just means the reactant will have a higher concentration because your reactant is in the denominator at that point. Right? It makes much more sense to think about this logically than try to memorize facts that aren't going to carry you if you switch the type of problem that it is. All right, so now let's take, for example, if the pH is greater than the pKa. So now I change this to 3.9 or 4.0 or whatever you want to do. Now this is going to be a positive number, right? Take the 10 to the, the raised to the positive number. And what will you always get? A whole number. Yeah. You'll always get a greater than one number. You can try it. You'll always get greater than one. So what does that mean? That the numerator or the denominator is larger. The numerator is larger. What will your numerator always be? The product. So the product has higher concentration because the numerator is larger. That's how you get the greater than one ratio. This slide has a lot of problems to it. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it, but you need to think more math than memorizing. Does that make sense to you? The approach would be on a multiple choice question where it would ask you what's the higher concentration. You can do that in your head. You don't need to do any logs. You don't need to raise 10 to anything. You're just looking at negative and positive 10 to the power. So, oops. Uh, let's look at the next problem. A buffered solution was created by mixing solutions of that with that. The final pH was measured to be 2.89. The K is that. Which species, this or this, has the highest concentration? You don't even need to use your calculator. You can. You don't need to, though. You can just do this without it. Well, sort of. You would need, you would need a PKA. And you could... I don't know if you can. No. Okay. Uh, like you can in a sense, right? Because if you take, you can do a log in your head by doing one times ten to the negative fourth would have been a four, right? You know that. Well, what is what's what is um, if I say the pH is four, what's the concentration? Ten to the negative fourth, which is one times ten to the negative fourth. You don't know that then you've just never stared at it long enough to realize that's what it is. If pH equals 4.0, what's the H plus concentration? 10 to the negative 4. Yeah, but that doesn't work with that. If it was like negative 4.3. Well, of course that wouldn't work for 4.3, I agree. But it can ballpark you. That's what I'm saying. Ballparks are important, too, to understand where it would be. So, like, for example, if this were negative 5, 1 times 10 to the negative 5th, then we could sort of go in between these and recognize where it would be, right? So, like, 0.5 or whatever. Okay, so back to this. Take your Ka with your calculator and use, find the pKa. Then assess what it should be. Okay, so when you go to K, what's, like, the sig figs? in the Ka, anytime that you take the log of anything... The sig figs and the number that you're taking the log of turn into the decimals. So the pKa here is 3.74. Now you should be able to do this in your head. Right? 1 times 7 to the 4th would have given us 4. 1.8 times 7 to the negative 4th gave us 3.74. All right, so now you're going to evaluate which is going to give you the higher concentration. 
So you think about it, do you get a negative, do you get a positive, is your ratio going to be greater than one or a decimal, and then what does that mean? Everybody do it. Let everybody try. So you set up your henderson hasselbach as it should be for this buffer, right? And then I take the information that it gave me, and it says if the pH is 2.89, is equal to my pK is 3.74 plus the log of, and I'm going to say x, because of this whole piece is x. If I subtract this out, I'm going to get a negative number. 10 to the negative number will always give a decimal. A decimal means that my denominator is larger, which means that is my reactant. And then if I look back at what I wrote, what I wrote was the acid is the reactant. I mean, it helps so much to write everything out so you don't have to think about it. And then H, the acid, is going to be in the higher concentration. So the reactant is larger, higher concentration. Okay. Reactions with buffered solutions. This slide is crucial for what we're going to do the rest of today and for Monday, and for your quiz on Tuesday. So you need to understand that when you add the disturbance into your buffer, that you have to pick the piece that's going to react with it, right? You're in a buffer zone. There are two things always in a buffer. What are they? An acid and a base, always in your buffer, right? So if I add in the disturbance of a base, who reacts with it? The acid, and if I add in an acid, then the base reacts with it, right? You have to understand that when you do these. So hydrobromic acid is added to a buffered solution. What is hydrobromic acid? It's the disturbance. That's the piece that's getting thrown in. So when you understand that that's the disturbance, then you're choosing which thing it's going to react with that's inside this buffer. So what's in my buffer? Acetic acid. So I'm going to write out my first reaction because you know me and I would write reactions out for everything. And then it's salt. What am I gonna write? We did this yesterday. Na with the acetate. And then one way arrow because that's complete dissociation with a group 1A. So I have lots of this floating in the beaker and lots of this floating in the beaker, right? Now write the net ionic equation for the reaction that's actually taking place. These aren't reactions. This is just me showing you how to figure out what's in the beaker, right? I mean, in a sense, they're reactions because they're breaking apart. But what the, re the net ionic equation is what happens when this gets thrown in. All right, hydrobromic acid is strong, agreed? So I'm only going to write H+. I dump in H+, into this beaker. My beaker is currently only containing lots of this and lots of this. There is some sodium floating around for sure, right? But it's just these two pieces. So H plus gets dumped in, who does it react with? Acetate, right? And then what does it make? One way arrow because it's a strong acid. It makes acetic acid again. This is it. That's your net ionic equation. This is it, yes. We need this because we're going to do math with it in a little while. We're going to figure out what the concentration of the buffers are once we add in the disturbance. Okay? How would be a like, one-way arrow? Because this is a strong acid. Oh. Yep. So it will not ask you, it doesn't say go ahead and write out both of these reactions, but you know that I think that's so important for you, right? Write out the both of those dissociations and then look at what's going to react with your disturbance. Try it again. We don't write the BR right because it's strong. Yes, you don't write it because it's strong. All right, the next one. Sodium hydroxide is added to a buffered solution containing hydrofluoric acid and its salt. Write the net ionic equation for the overall. So now you're going to do the same thing that we just did. Identify your buffer by writing out the two reactions and then identify the disturbance and who it specifically reacts with. So your two pieces that you have, a lot of are HF, and you have a lot of F minus, right? 
So you dump in hydroxide, hydroxide's a base, a base will react with an acid. The only acid in your beaker is HF. So HF plus OH gives you basically your conjugate base again. Good? Oh, good. All right, these next few slides I'm just gonna whip through really fast. You know this information to be true already, but I'm just trying to kind of add it in with now where we, we have solutions, we have some solubility, and then we put in a disturbance, what happens to the solubility. So the first thing, let's just look at this reaction. Magnesium hydroxide is not very soluble because it's not a strong base, right? So it's not one of our strong bases, so I use a one-way, double-way arrow. And then the idea is, if you add H plus to this, this will react with this. Do you remember that multiple choice question when we did equilibrium and it was like, how can you make this reaction shift to the right? And none of the answers were right, but it was like, add six molar HNO3. And you're all like, why would you do that? And I'm like, look, if you put in HNO3, it makes H plus, and H plus reacts with OH and removes it, and the reaction drives right. Remember that question? Yeah, you all have that wrong. <laughs> Except it wasn't a test question. It was just one of these that we did in class. Yeah. So this is an acid and base question that is showing you that they react together to make water. So if it removes the OH, it drives the solubility forward, which means it makes it more soluble. So adding H plus can increase the solubility of something that has low solubility. So just showing you the nut ionic equation. It's going to ask you to write reactions, but I already did this with you, so we're not going to do it again. I'm just going to show it to you. Calcium carbonate is placed in a solution of hydrochloric acid. You would have written this yesterday or two days ago. You wouldn't have used calcium to do the reaction because you said calcium comes from a strong base, so I'm going to use carbonate. But since it's a solid, I'm going to write the whole thing. And then in your mind, you're going to take, I'm taking CO3 minus 2, and I'm putting it in an excess of hydrochloric acid. It should say excess here. It doesn't. And then that means I'm putting in extra H+, plus. it makes carbonic acid, you know this, carbonic acid dissociates into H2O with CO2-, minus, and then I have my leftover spectator ion calcium. We already did this slide. It's just kind of showing you again, I don't know, reaction writing, and then we're going to add in acids or bases to increase solubility. Same thing with this, we did metal oxides. What do metal oxides produce? Metal hydroxides, and if they're not soluble, then the reaction stays together, and if it is soluble, then you break them apart. So magnesium hydroxide is not soluble, but if you add it into this acid, which it is trying to show you, right? If you add an acid, it's going to drive the reaction further to the right. That's what it's trying to show you. So this would have been magnesium oxide goes into water, it makes a metal hydroxide. But if you put it into the acid, it's going to drive the equilibrium further to the right, which would then make it dissociate more. Uh, same thing with this. If it's a weak acid, you would react it. You would just look at the result. Magnesium hydroxide you would have written together because it's not as strong. You would have written acetic acid together because it's not as strong. And then you would have recognized that you're going to use the magnesium and the acetate or spectator, and you make water with H plus and OH minus. You would have done that anyway. And then this is just showing you again, same setup. I'm literally skipping through all these because you did them all already. If you want to look at them again, uh, you can ask to see my slides. So what I'd like to do now for your sake uh, is go through... You can try those on your own and then check them. They're, if you're not sure, then that means that you still don't understand lecture three anyway. You should be fine because you understand lecture three. And then if you want to do those this weekend, uh, there's more practice problems here anyway. So if you take your lecture notes, um, if you go to the first set of questions, those are your homework problems to finish this weekend. If you take questions 15 through 19, those are the slides I just skipped through. So you can likely get through those because you already did. So finishing nine through 14. You're finishing that whole section, yeah. I'm not going to go over any of those today. Nine of all of them. Then let's go to the second sheet. Remember that it just doubled up. There's not. There's just one sheet there. I say try these extra circle problems. Anticipate quiz questions. So you can try all the circle problems. I'm going to do some with you in class, but. 
perhaps you want to try the rest of them, just keep trying them. That would be great. And then it also gives you questions 18 through 22 on the back is additional practice problems of writing reactions. So you can try them all. Okay? We are going to start with, I believe, number four right now. So typically, when you see these questions, before you even start them and you recognize, hey, this is a buffer, you should always write out your reactions, always. And again, you can approach these two different ways. You can use Henderson-Hasselbach or you can use the KI. I will use Henderson-Hasselbach this whole time. So the first part says, a buffered solution is created by dissolving 0 0.30 moles of sodium cyanide in 510 milliliters of hydrocyanic acid. It gives the KA. Assume the volume doesn't change. Find the pH of the solution. Before you start this problem, what should you do? Write, Write both of your reactions out. So we have HCN, double way arrow, H plus plus CN minus. We have NACN, one way arrow because it's complete dissociation. And then we have lots of cyanide floating around in my beaker, and I have lots of HCN floating around in my beaker. So I'm literally going to draw a beaker for this one so that you can see what's floating in there for our next part. All right, so before we start this, it's asking, what's the pH of this solution? What's the pH of a buffer, essentially? So what equation should you use? Henderson-Hasselbach. So I take my pH equals my pKa plus the log of, and I'm going to fill it in, CN minus over HCN. If you don't write out the equation as an expression to start, I find that students get confused. Can you guys just listen for one second? This part's tedious, right? You're already going to start plugging in your numbers. But I'm telling you that one area, I cannot even count how many times because it was so many, that students just accidentally put this number here and this number here. They have everything else right. They even came up with the right concentrations. They just flipped their numbers because they didn't write this out first and they just didn't match them correctly. They just put them in the wrong spot. So take the time to write it out so that you can tell yourself this is where that number goes and this is where that one goes. All right, so now let's start plugging in to find pH. We're going to do the negative log of our Ka value, 6.2 times 10 to the negative 10 plus the log of, and now I have to find the concentration of CN minus. CN minus comes from NACN, which is 0 0.30 moles over the volume, which is 0 0.510 liters. So you solve for this piece and you get 0.59 molar CN minus. So this will be 0.59 over the original concentration of HCN is 0.55. We know that that equilibrium pushes that reaction even further to the left, so I'm going to definitely be able to use the HCN value right here. So I plug this in and I solve. So now for part B, the question says, find the pH after 0.25 moles of nitric acid is added to the solution. Assume the volume doesn't change. This is your disturbance. Everybody pause. I am going to pass out my notes. So remember I said you should write yourself a set of notes on how to handle each problem? These were my notes. They're not going to be extensive, so you probably will want to use them and then like add in little ideas as you're doing this. There's three parts of a buffer always. In other words, there's three scenarios. You have a buffer that hasn't had anything happen to it yet. So before your buffer, how do you find pH? You use this. This is before anything happens. In the middle is where your buffer is starting to take all these hits by some sort of disturbance. Like remember we talked yesterday about a buffer being like a pillow? So it's like someone's punching the pillow. All right, so we're in the midst of this fight in the buffer battle. And then after that, we buffer out. There's no more uh, buffer available to accept that disturbance, and the disturbance just overrides the entire reaction. So you have before uh, any addition, after you've added some, and once you've buffered out. 
So we're going to have three types of problems always if we're looking at moles of a disturbance being added in. So I'm going to pass this out to you. We're going to start the problem. Then you're going to add in notes to this as you're working. So let's read this together. It says HA is combined with a salt to make A minus, or you have A minus combined with a salt to make HB, which is your base. To find pH, you must use Henderson-Hasselbach with either of those scenarios, right? Notice that I put HB plus and then B as just the neutral. It could be a variety of ways. It could be a minus and then uh, just neutral HB. So the first step is before addition of any acid or base, you find the pH from the info given the problem. You can use Henderson-Hasselbach, but sometimes the answer will be right there in the problem. Like it'll say uh, the H plus concentration is blah, blah, blah. So do you really need to use Henderson-Hasselbach? No, you can just do the negative log of H plus. Every problem will have some sort of different piece of information. So just before anything is added, you find H plus directly from the problem with the info that's there. Then after you add any acid or base, this is what we're about to do. The first step, which I didn't write because I do it all the time, you should do it, is what? Right. Write the reaction. So maybe write that in there right now. The first step before using your ice chart is to right there say, write the reaction. The reaction is of the disturbance. So who does the disturbance react with? That's what you're trying to figure out. That's what you're going to make your ice chart out of. I'm on the second little star where it says after addition of any acid or base, your first point should be write the reaction of the disturbance. Then we're going to use an ice chart to subtract out basically the limiting reactant and add it to our products. And then, look here, the ratios of this and this will change. Because if I add that base, it's going to react with this, right? And this will go away, but it will form this. This is sort of on our slides yesterday. If I put an acid, this will get eaten up and it will form this. So the ratio is the only thing that's going to change in our Henderson-Hasselbach when we're using a buffer. We have to just keep adjusting the numbers until all of a sudden we've buffered out and we can't use Henderson-Hasselbach anymore because it's not a buffer. And that's that last bullet is once you've buffered out, all the buffers used, you can't use Henderson-Hasselbach and you find the pH directly from the excess amount of H plus or OH present. And I didn't write it there, but you should. To do that in the very last step, you simply use pH equals negative log of H plus. pH equals negative log of H plus or pOH equals the negative log of the OH minus. That's the very last bullet should say that in case you don't know that. That's how you find pH. Or pH equals log. So pH equals negative log of H Or pOH equals the negative log of the OH concentration. Yes. The H plus concentration we use that last part of the excess. Yes. It's how much will be left over. All right, so let's take, uh, I'm just going to kind of shift over on this side. I'm going to leave the rest of this up. Let's take the la that second part there. So it says, find the pH after 0.25 moles of nitric acids added. Can you write the reaction of the disturbance? That's your first step. So write the reaction of the disturbance. So I'm adding a nitric acid, so I'm only going to write H+, plus, and I put H+, plus into this beaker previously that I drew. Who does H+, plus react with? CN-. minus. And that's a one-way arrow, and it's going to make HCN. Agreed? So I'm going to rice chart this. So I'm going to use moles in here and not concentration because I want to know how many moles of what are reacting with each other. So I'm going to calculate from here, uh, well, this one is given to me. How many moles of nitric acid are given? 0.25 moles, okay? How many moles of CN minus are there? That's given already, 0 0.30 moles, right? The one that I don't know, right, how many are in here? No, and that's what everyone wants to say is zero because we wrote zero all along, right? Because before we did this, when you put just this or just this, this is what it really was, when you put just that reaction into a beaker, this was zero. We didn't know how much was formed. So we wrote x and x, and then we write x squared over that, right? But we actually have that in there. It's floating in there already, don't we? 0.28 moles. So you take your original concentration that we had earlier, which was 
0.55 molar HCN is equal to X moles over 0 0.510 liters. This is given to you already in the problem, right? So I'm going to put here 0.28 moles. That's the one thing that a lot of students just forget. You have initial amounts of both pieces because it's a buffer. You have both pieces. So maybe on your note sheet where you write the ice chart, make sh maybe you should write a note for yourself. No zeros initially. There aren't any zeros to start with. So who is the limiting reactant? H plus or CN minus? H plus. There's less of it, right? In other words, all the H plus will get reacted with immediately. So 0.25 goes away. 0.25 goes away here. And then I add 0.25 moles of this over here. So see how the ratio in this is going to change, right? I'll have less and more. It has to go up and down. So I have zero moles of this. I have 0 0.05 moles of this. And I have 0.53 moles of this. Okay, so now look at this. These are going to be your new ratios. So I'm going to divide these by 0 0.510 liters, divide this by 0 0.510 liters, and I come up with for this one 0.1 molar CN minus and 1.0 molar HCN. Make sure you label them because if you don't label them, you're going to end up with not knowing which one it is. All right, so now I'm going to put this back into my Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So instead of these being the values like they were before, now I'm going to fix them. All right, so now because I wrote this out for myself early on, see why that's really helpful? I'm just going to go match it to the one that I just wrote, and it's 0.1 over 1.0 molar. And then I solve again for pH. What? Because it's CN minus over HCN. Right? This is it is really important. JC's making a good point. Like if you if you don't write this, remember I just said make sure you write it. If you don't write it and you go backwards, you're gonna take this product and put that there. And you're gonna mess it up. So always write the expression. Expression means without numbers. Write the expression before you start. So you go and plug this in, and the answer is 8.2. So our pH went from a 9.4 something, 9.24 to 8.2, using up almost all of the buffer. So in here, we only have one sig fig, so I can only have one decimal. 8.2. All right, so the role of a buffer is to have the ability to resist change in pH. So I know to you, maybe you're like, eh, it went from 9.2, now it's 8.2. That's, that's not resisting it. I'm going to show you, even though this question isn't in your slides, what happens when you buffer out? So how many more moles of H plus can be added to this buffer? Well, should we be able to look at that and answer that? 0 0.05. I said how many more moles of H plus can this accept? It can only accept 0 0.05 more moles, right? Because this is only left with 0 0.05 moles of this. Once I exceed that, I buffer out. There's no more buffer. So I'm going to make that problem up for you. I just want you to see it. You can watch or you can write it down. If I add in here instead 0.35 moles, can you erase all this? If I put in 0.35 moles, now which one's the limiting reactant? CN minus. All right, so I'm going to read you the ice chart here. I subtract out 0.30, 0 0.30, and I add 0 0.30 moles to this. So this is going to be left over with 0 0.05 moles, 0 moles, and then 0.58 moles. Even if you wanted to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, it wouldn't work. Because you would be putting a 0 in for CN minus, right? 
So what does your equate, your little uh, sheet tell you to do? Use a negative log of the excess. So I have excess moles here. So I'm simply going to find the concentration of this by dividing by 0 0.510 liter. And I will tell you, many of you will directly go and plug in negative log of 0 0.05. And you're going to get the wrong answer, right? Is that what that just is? Yes, I'm not, I know. I know what happens. Maybe tell yourself on a note, make sure you divide by liters first because you have to find concentration. So this is 0 0.098. Maybe I need to use less. Uh, nope, I got to do that. So that's going to be 0 0.10. I have to use sig figs correctly. So this is my H plus concentration. That's just floating around now. Nothing reacted with it. Nothing ate it up. So this is just going to float there. So pH is directly the negative log of 0 0.10. So I take the negative log of 0 0.1 and I get a pH of, which I should have done in my head, 1.00. Do you see by adding in just 0 0.05 moles more, the pH went from 8.2 to 1? So a strong acid or strong base will immediately drop your pH the second there's like two, a drop extra of it in there. It immediately drops or increases your pH of a solution. Everybody get this? So when we went from like 9.2 to 8.2, that was a good resisting of pH in there. So these are the three parts, before addition, in the middle of an addition, and then after the addition. You may have to do multiple in the middle additions. Like what's the pH after you add... 0.5 moles. What's the addition after 0.2 moles? And then you'll know you buffer out when there's no more moles left of the reactant that it should be eating it up. Okay? All right, we're going to try one more before you leave number six. And the reason why I want to choose this one is why. What can you say? Yep, yeah, it's a base. And you need to know how to handle bases. Yes? So, say they give us a concentration of H plus, not a Inside the chart? Yes. Um, like, do we make it easier on ourselves by using moles? Or can we just use well, you definitely should mo use moles because it's like a limiting reactant problem. You're doing moles, comparing it to moles. They are all in the same volume. So in reality, like, our volumes here in the ratio, I think I showed you guys yesterday, it will cancel out. So technically, you could just put moles directly into Henderson Hasselbach. So you don't. But I hesitate to tell you to do that because then you don't do that here. You have to use concentration. All right. So number six is our base. So let's look at that. A buffered solution is created by dissolving 0.275 moles of ammonium chloride in 550 milliliters of a 0.38 molar ammonia solution, KBs 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. Assume that the volume doesn't change. Find the pH of the buffered solution. What should you do first? Reaction. Write your reaction. What did you do? Uh-oh. So this is your base buffer. It's made with a base, so you have to write out your base reactions. And then your salt is going to be your conjugate acid in this case. So Unfortunately for you, the slides that you're going to see and all of your homework, this is the only one that it gives you a base problem. I promise you I'm going to give you base problems because the AP exam does. And I don't want you to just think it only ever happens with acids. You can use an acid or you can use a base. So this problem probably is worth your time to try it again after you've done all of your homework and just make sure you can handle the base. So you use both of these pieces in here. Uh, and we're going to calculate the pH of the buffer solution. So because I have a base, what do I need to use for henderson hasselbach pH. P-O-H. And you're going to write the expression, aren't you? Before you solve anything, you're going to write it out so that you know which pieces are floating in that beaker. So I'm just going to simply solve for P-O-H here by doing the negative log of the K-B. Not ne Not what? Yes. Sorry. Which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative fifth plus the log of, and I need to solve for my concentrations using those moles, and it turns out to be 0 0.50 over 0.38. Can you just trust me so that we can get through this? Just write 0.5 over 0.38. And you got the, 
All right, so this is the pOH, so I cannot forget that I have to subtract this from 14. You'll know that you messed up if you get a pH value that's acidic and you're using a base. Like if this was my answer and I was like, hey, I got a pH of 4.8, that doesn't make sense because you put a base in water and you have OH floating around, so this needs to be basic. So I'm going to take 14 minus 4.86, and my pH now is a basic range. The answer is 9.14. This is before any addition of anything. All right, so now I go ahead and I add in part B, uh, 0 0.084 moles of lithium hydroxide. I'm not going to have time to do that. Um, so who does the lithium hydroxide react with? Do you all see how you have to write out the next reaction? That's why I wrote on your little note sheet, told yourself to, told yourself to write the disturbance reaction. So this goes with NH4 plus one-way arrow. Uh, it's going to be NH3 plus water. Now you make your ice chart. Can you handle this? Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to go and finish that up, and then we'll, I'll jot down the answer.